and I wanted to offer a short meditation that I've been working a lot with in the work that I do with Climate Hope um, around how do we actually find hope, love, and connection in the times of struggle and, and hardship. Um, <clears throat> and this is a meditation that um, was passed to me by a tomb and was passed to a tomb, is my understanding, um, by the Bible. Bible. So <clears throat> just get yourself comfortable rooting into your sit bones. And I'll just read this. I'll just read, say this meditation a couple of times. Take a few deep breaths. Deeply rooted in the present moment with a clear, open, spacious mind seeing beyond doubt and fear, abiding in the luminous heart of equanimity, the way unfolds before me. Deeply rooted in the present moment with a clear, open, spacious mind Seeing beyond doubt and fear, abiding in the luminous heart of equanimity, the way unfolds before me. Deeply rooted in the present moment, with a clear, open, spacious mind, seeing beyond doubt and fear, abiding in the luminous heart of equanimity, the way unfolds before me. Tim, thank you so much for um, offering us that meditation. And um, uh, I and others, no doubt, have been spreading it through the world. And I don't know if you remember, but you said to me when we were in Bhutan together that if there was one single practice that you would work with for the rest of your life, it would be that meditation. And I have found that to be true. So thank you so much and, and welcome, Atum. Be with you as always. And um, just a joy to have a connection to a hollyhock fits in such a living way. We're trying to work out a couple of things at the moment. Visually, I don't know if you can see us, but we have a sign on the front. Um, so we're just working to clear that. Oh, and it happened. That's grace, one of the themes I'm really living with at the present moment. In times of uncertainty, really be aware of grace. It comes in big openings, it comes in small moments, it comes in synchronicity. So that's one of the themes I'm really living with is how present grace can be in your life in times of uncertainty if you hold an awareness of that possibility. But beautiful to connect to a hollyhock. A hollyhock is both a physical place for me but a place that lives in my soul. It's a place sometimes when I need to just feel incredible beauty, a world of light and splendor, kind of renew myself after much travel. I just contemplate hollyhock or being on Smelt Bay, the garden, and it's always a source of incredible renewal. I know that is for other people who come, but remember you can carry hollyhock in you. You can return there. It has a space that will renew your soul. You can live with it. So it's a joy to be connected again, for sure. And to be with you, Karen. I have to say, her wedding was incredible. And what she also, she and Robert said at the wedding, is our wedding is to show you a way through what may be difficult times in the future. Little at that, 
At that moment, we had no idea of what would unfold with the virus. And uh, they said, what we're offering you is the sense of love and community will carry us through. Your words were prophetic because here we are, not, not many months away from that incredible wedding. And I think that is what people are, are discovering. Love and community is really a cornerstone, a stepping stone to find your way through a time of uncertainty. So thank you again. It was beautiful. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Um, so Tim, so what we're, we're going to do for, for everyone actually is we're going to, um, uh, uh, I'm going to ask Atum some questions. We'll be in some discussion. Um, and if you have questions you would like to ask Atum, you are free to put them in the chat. You're encouraged to put them in the chat and uh, I will skim them and um, see if I can uh, represent them. And then uh, after we've had some time together, we will put, we'll go into some small groups uh, for the last half hour or so of our call um, and just do some reflection on what we've heard. And it's been fascinating. This is our fifth week of doing this. Um, that the, that uh, most people sort of think, oh, I don't really want to go in a small group. And I don't really, I just, I just want to sit in my, my couch and hear what has to be said. Um, which I totally understand. I have exactly that response. And time and time again, what we hear is that the small group sharing is as important or more important for people than anything that they, that they actually heard. Um, there's something about speaking the truth of our experience right now and having it witnessed by others, um, even in this Zoom forum, and maybe even in some ways enhanced by the Zoom forum. Um, we have seen, I've, I've been part of many groups in which there's been a real lovely intimacy and connection, which has been very healing. So I encourage you to stay for the small groups if you um, feel called to do so. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, do go ahead and, and put them in the chat. Uh, and maybe I'll just start us off with him by saying, um, um, you mentioned grace at the beginning of this. Um, and I think people have a sense of what you mean by that, but uh, you said if it's available to us. So I think a lot of what I'm hearing from people are, you know, what does this moment mean? And what are the ways that I can be more connected to a sense of grace, as it were? Um, they might use different words, but how do I, you know, how do, how do I hold my center at this time, in fact? Um, and what does this time mean? What are we meant to be learning at this time. Would you reflect on that for us? Well, one is, <clears throat> I think people need to look and see what's your relationship with grace. Is grace something that you feel engaged with? Do you have a relationship with grace? And maybe you have to redefine it with a different word if that word was somehow tainted in your earlier religious upbringing. But uh, it's a reminder for me, one of the ways I look at grace, is my life has been deeply shaped by people that I encountered, especially mentors in my life. And I didn't know any of them existed. They came into my life. I didn't know them. I didn't even know what they offered. I didn't know their background. I had never even heard of some of them. They came into my life. And they changed my life profoundly. My children came into my life. I didn't know them as particular individuals. Those four children came into my life. That's grace. I couldn't have willed it. My ego couldn't have arranged it because it didn't even know that they existed. They came into my life. And I think to recognize what comes into your life that's of enormous benefit, that opens up possibilities, shows you ways, gives you new understanding, gives you opportunity, shows possibilities, enlarges your life or your understanding of yourself. It can be through a conversation that's happened to me many times on an airplane with someone. I've never met them before. We're on a plane sitting next to each other for an hour. Something unfolds in our conversation and we both leave enriched and enlarged 
with a sense of possibilities in our life. To me, that's grace. Why did that person end up sitting next to me? Why did I end up sitting next to them? What is it that created that possibility that I certainly could not have done? I didn't know they existed. So to me, it's an awareness of grace functioning in our life all the time. And then do we have a conscious relationship with it? Do we invite it when we need it? Like we would call a friend if we really needed connection. Well, call on grace. Invite it to come into your life when you feel that you need it. And look for it around you. It can appear in the most mundane ways and something opens, but grace opens away. So we have that very famous song, Amazing Grace. I once was lost. Well, when you're lost, ask for grace. Uh, but now I'm found. I was blind. I couldn't see a way out of this possibility. And somewhere, a way opened beyond what I knew was possible, beyond the capabilities of my will. Grace provided a way. So that's what I mean by grace, especially in passage times, in times of uncertainty, where we don't, the clear plan isn't going to work, open to grace. And um, often it comes in conversations with very good friends or with strangers. So it can come in all kinds of ways if you're open to it. And as Carl Jung said, uh, something that really has affected my life, he said, look at your attitude toward any archetype, and that will shape how the archetype comes to you. So looking at your attitude toward grace is a very helpful practice if you want it more present in your life. Um, when I look at the change in my lifetime from what would have seemed possible to me as a, someone in high school to what my life has turned out to be, it's astounding grace, just astounding. Now, there's also the grace of the time in which I lived and the change of consciousness that's occurring in my time. To be born in this particular time, as Reb Zalman, one of my mentors in Jewish mysticism and the psychology of religion, used to say to me, there's four great times to be born in the world, and we're born in one of them. An axial age is the term used in mythology. And it's a time when there's enormous change of consciousness occurring. And you can use your life to serve, as you all have, that I'm seeing on the screen. You can use your life, much larger than a personal purpose, to serve the unfoldment of that new consciousness. That's grace to be born in that time, from my perspective. Uh -huh. So that's a rather lengthy answer, but that's what I would offer. No, that's beautiful. And, and uh, someone in the chat was saying, you know, really define grace. So if I was going to um, reflect on what you said there, I would, I would define it as um, sort of the, well, it's, um, it's actually finding the path forward. It's the opening and the new possibilities um, that, that come when one is um, open to them coming or when one is um, in a receiving place. Well, that's a key piece also, to be in a receiving place and to live with the awareness that grace can enter your life any single moment. Um, it happened to me recently in New Zealand. I went to take a taxi to a town 20 minutes away, and the woman who drove the taxi was a Maori woman, and the conversation that we had in 20 minutes was unbelievable. And uh, I saw in her an example of fierce compassion in a woman. I mean, really fierce compassion, because she also drives the school bus. And we went around these winding roads around hills and mountains. And she said, sometimes people try to pass on that curve. And I've got all these children. And she said, uh, that could force us off the road and they could be hurt or killed. So when I go into the town, I look for them. <laughs> and I go right up to them and I say, do you realize what you just did? And she said, they kind of look at me and I say, I have these children that I'm holding and carrying. And you to get on your schedule 
risk the lives of those children. If they had died, how would you have felt for the rest of your life? And she said to me, some people think I'm grumpy, <laughs> but I'm going to stand by those children and their safety. So I met her in a taxi, and then she talked about the parents of some of the children not caring for the children. And I simply said to her, why don't you call a meeting of the parents? I saw her six days later, she had called the meeting, shocked me incredibly. And out of that meeting, profound sharing arise, arose that changed the relationship of many families. So I was just sitting in a taxi. All I said was, why don't you have a meeting? So that's an example to me of grace. And the more you become aware of it, Jung called it synchronicity, tried to give it a, a term for our time. But it's there, the more you are aware of it, it just multiplies, especially in difficult times, especially. Be open to uh, it. Kim, you have said to us um, uh, many times that the principal teaches, that the principal teaching is essentially to look and listen. I believe that Rumi has, has a, a more uh, poetic way of saying it. Can you remind me? Well, you said it very uh, clearly. You, he says in a poem, look and notice. Look and notice. And looking is awareness. Hold an open field of awareness and then notice what arises that is coming toward you for guidance or as a gift. So a Sufi teacher whose teaching has been very important to me said, if you're looking for guidance, recognize every person that comes into your life offers you an opportunity for guidance at any moment. Because look at them and see what's their path and where has it led them? And is that a direction I'm called to go? Are they in my life out of a sense of synchronicity, even if it's just an exchange in the airport? Is there a relationship, as Jung would say, to meeting this person at this moment in my life in the conversation that we have? Does that come into my life through synchronicity because it's relating to something in my own journey? So that to me is an example of look, hold a field of awareness, and then notice what comes in, in the synchronistic aspects of your life and your journey. To me, that has been very important, especially in terms of encountering people that I've never met before. What's the synchronicity of meeting them at this moment in my life, not four years earlier or five years later, but that there's an exchange at this moment and what guidance might they be offering me or I may be offering them. As Jung said, what happens with people is without knowing it, consciously usually, our psyche is checking out another person's psyche to see if there's something there that's of value. And they're checking out our psyche. So that is going on often when we're unaware of it and it creates a field of guidance. So that's what, especially in times of uncertainty, I think it's to recognize you're not alone, isolated in it. You're in a, in a journey that has ways of drawing toward you what is needed, but you have to recognize it. You have to be aware. So. Look and notice. And, and Atum, if, I mean, it's, we're all struggling to find meaning in this crazy time. Um, and, you know, we can... We, we can create whatever story, uh, different types of stories that we, um, that we can imagine around this. But if there is, um, we talked about grace, if there is a central uh, teaching or practice that this time is offering us, um, what would you say that it is? Well, I think the world, I've been feeling this for a whole number of years, um, the world is birthing a new consciousness, and it has to. There's no way the planet and humanity can go forward in the present condition that we were living in before the virus without enormous destruction being done. And in many ways, it's a form of suicide, the way we've treated the environment upon which we are completely dependent. 
So something has to change if humanity and the planet is going to go forward. And in my private practice for many years, what one sees is people talk about wanting to change, but for many people, they only change when the suffering is so great that there's no other option for them. So that's where I think we are as a planet. We were reached the point and uh, the planet has tried to show us in so many ways, we are not in harmony with the planet. We are mistreating it, we are abusing it, and it's our source of life, it sustains us. It's, we are nature, we're integrated and in, we live from it, but we don't have that approach at all. So the new consciousness has to be born. And I think one of the gifts of the virus is we've become, as human beings, intoxicated or inflated with our sense of power and grandiosity. And we've acted in a grandiose way toward the planet. And we know that there might be all kinds of large and painful um, disruptions, disruptions in nature. But the way I see nature is teaching us is little did we know how the whole system would break down in such a short period of time by something we cannot even see. We can't see the virus. This is incredible. Nature is reminding us, you think you're inflated? You have atomic weapons, you can do this, you can send somebody to the moon, you have all this inflation. Well, guess what? Here we come to show you, you can't even see it. And the whole thing is collapsed. So humility, I think that's a place we have to deeply go back to, is humility rather than inflation and grandiosity, and come into a true sense of humility. And the best definition I've heard of in terms of humility is the essence of humility is right relationship. And we have not been in right relationship with the planet, we have not been in right relationship with the rest of one human family. These are the core right relationships we need to, to learn how to come into. And that's humility. And the other de definition of humility that I've really appreciated is humility is a way out of self-absorption. And intoxication is a form of self-absorption. We've been lost in that. And uh, it's a time of potentially great awakening from my perspective. So um, I'm, uh, that's my perspective on it. And I hope, I just hope, Jung speaks about the difference between a crisis and a passage. So you could say we're in a crisis now. And if we take that approach, what people do in a crisis is they simply want to get back as fast as they can to what life was beforehand. A passage is you go through that experience and you come out with a different consciousness on the other end. That, I think, is the possibility of what we're experiencing with the virus. And I hope my prayer is that humanity really takes the opportunity to grow in consciousness through this and not just return to a previous state and deny what, what we have gone through. Um, and, you know, I also look at it in terms of this is the whole world. The whole world is going through this virus and the ramifications of it. So we can either return to nationalism and do what people have done often with illnesses that have moved through certain parts of the world, put its blame on certain group of people. That's the old way. This is the Chinese virus. No, this is the human virus. It's not the Chinese virus. We're all everywhere experiencing it. So that's where the growth lies. You can go back to that old mentality, or the growth is we are one human family having to find our way through this. And from what I understand, never in the history of humanity have scientists from so many different countries been working together. To me, that's the way forward. That's very much the way forward. So I see possibility. 
a growth in consciousness. And, uh, and I also see preparation, if from the environmental destruction that we've created, that there will be ramifications as nature tries to reorder itself. This is preparation. How are we going to meet it? How are we going to meet what could be level, just on the level of the melting of the ice caps in certain parts of the world? This is preparation from my perspective. And I hope we wisely, wisely learn from it. So that's, that's where I find meaning. Uh -huh. And I'm struck by this teachings around, you know, that birth, that, that uh, chaos and the birth is actually a relatively chaotic and painful process. And that uh, before, um, before the, the new uh, can emerge, some of the old must uh, fall away um, or be torn asunder, uh, you know, um, if, that's what, if that's what it takes. Do you think there's a relationship with the depth of this crisis and the potential depth then for change that could emerge from it? Well, Jung said the alchemical child, and by that he meant a new consciousness. An alchemical child arises out of the marriage of chaos and order. So there's a chaos right now. There's uncertainty. Nobody knows really the way forward, how it will unfold, everybody. There's different theories, but how will this unfold? And then out of that chaos, we know this in our own life when we're in deep passage, a new order can begin to emerge. And that brings a new consciousness. That's the fruit of it. That's where I very much hope that we're able to go. And um, I would say last night, uh, another level of it for me really um, came forward, which was for the first time for me, the global ramifications. You can read the information about different parts of the world. You can get that daily, what they're experiencing. But uh, last night I was reading a report and it said by the end of the year, 265 million people may be facing starvation. Now, it also pointed out that there are 3 billion people in the world that have no way of washing their hands at home. Just think of that. And in many African countries, the health centers do not have in them places where people can wash their hand with soap. So as you know, Karen, my son Emmanuel works in a project in Uganda in Africa. And I went there last year, and uh, when I heard that news, having known these children, he works in an incredible project called Emesada. It is astounding. And there are street children that they take in. Um, you know, four years old, I met some people who came there when they were four years old, and now they're in their 20s. It is right next to uh, what we would call a ghetto. And we went through there where many of the children have come from. 250 people use the same toilet, which is a box. So we're extremely aware. You know, we have the sanitizers, we have the gloves, we have the mask. They don't have soap. They don't, I mean, so the ramifications of the world um, I think that's what we will begin to awaken. We've seen it primarily in fairly privileged countries, China, Europe, the United States. It's when it hits there, um, and, and to see these children, I mean, the joy, the love, the it changed my life. And my son had said to me, of the seven countries he worked with in Asia, children abandoned on the street, his name is Emmanuel, but the project in Africa was the most joyful place he has ever experienced in his life. And he's been in 60 countries. So when I was thinking of that, and they're making soap, the children are making soap for the people living in such situations. But that's what I mean about we have to see, awaken it to the one human family, to the globe, and what's humanity experiencing everywhere. 
And I think it holds that possibility of awakening. And I, I must say for myself, that struck me so deeply, not because it was information that I read, but because I stood in that project in Uganda and I was awed by the living joy of those children. So to know what could happen in a place like Uganda, which has 55 critical care beds that have ventilators in a population of 44 million. And there are some African countries that have no ventilators. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at it from the perspective of the first wealthy world with all kinds of resources. It's just beginning to emerge for us. What will this mean for the planet? Mm -hmm. And I think it provides us again the opportunity to really grow in planetary consciousness. So, yes. Yeah. Well, just, and to sit with that and hold the center is, of course, um, uh, a, a, a profound challenge to really open ourselves to the reality of that and take it in, not just an intellectual level, but at a, at a heart level and at a soul level. So there's a number of people in the chat um, and uh, otherwise uh, in my life also around me, uh, but particularly there's a series of people in the chat saying, is there a practice that you would recommend or perhaps that you've been working with yourself around centering um, in this difficult time? Surely there's, uh, first of all, the practice that you beautifully led is one that um, I teach a lot now, particularly because it starts with the phrase deeply rooted. You have to be rooted in your body, in your mind, in your heart heart deeply rooted and then also rooted in what are your deep values what gives you meaning in life return to that rooting again and again but there's one that i also would like to add to that and it's from his holiness dogo kensei rinpoche buddhist teacher of mine and um it's a way of staying rooted and the first phrase is do not burden your mind with useless thoughts. That is extremely important. We're being inundated by the media and it's serving a value. It's revealing to us the human condition, but people have to be very discerning of how much media do I take in? How much can I carry? That's the piece about staying centered. How much can I carry and stay centered and grounded and rooted? And not judging it. Okay, this piece I can carry and I can stay centered as I carried it. This is too much <laughs> and it, it, it overwhelms me. I'm lost in it. Go back to what you can carry and be centered in. That's extremely important in a time like this. So the other thing is your thoughts that come up, as Jung said, what makes you think your thoughts are your thoughts? A lot of thoughts arise from the collective. They're not our thoughts. They're filling the collective atmosphere because the media and people's reading of it and all these different, this, the world of thoughts is around us all the time in the human psyche. The key thing is the moment I identify, oh, that's my thought, I'm hooked into it. So one of the pieces is when he says, why do you burden your mind with useless thoughts? If I'm feeling weighed down, heavy, um, inundated, overwhelmed with all these thoughts, I need to stop and really see, is that a useless thought? Or is that thought actually insightful, informative. I need discernment, and that's the second key. If I'm going to hold this center, I need to have discernment, both in terms of the thoughts that I take in, but also the dramas that I get engaged in and the different kinds of feelings that may be floating around me. I need discernment and I need to ask the question, is that arising up in me or where does that come from? 
So there's an image I learned from Dilgo Kense Rinpoche that changed my life. He said, um, people say on a cloudy day, look, the sky is filled with clouds. And he said, but that's only the perspective from the earth. I spend a lot of time I have in airplanes. If you go above the clouds and you come into the blue sky, the clouds are not in the sky. That's only the perspective from the earth. The sky itself is always blue, clear, luminous. So it's the perspective that you're looking from that's important. And that's a key question to ask. Why do I burden myself with these useless thoughts? Because I need to stay clear, hold a center, carry what I can carry. And this piece is a burdensome thought, and it doesn't come from me. It doesn't rise up from the core of my being. So that's the first piece to stop periodically when you're having thoughts run through your mind. And they're pulling at you in different directions. Well, why am I caught in this? Step back, discern what's, what's a helpful thought as opposed to a burdensome thought. So that's the first line of the practice. Do not burden your mind with useless thoughts. You know, there are people now who have three garages. And the third garage is for all the things that they can't fit in the cellar in the attic. <laughs> That's the point we reached. And for some of us, our mind is the same way. We keep stuffing it with more information, more stuff, but it's not necessarily useful at all, nor does it necessarily have any relevance to our life or to our journey. But we like stuff. <laughs> so we keep collecting stuff. And it, sometimes it's really important to clear out what you can carry. <clears throat> and not be burdened. The second line, which I find incredible, especially at this time, do not brood about the past. And the key word is brooding. Because when you brood, you're caught in an emotional field. There's no place for insight in brooding. You're, you're in a stew of brooding and it takes you nowhere. You're possessed by the brooding emotion. So why do you brood about the past? It just puts you in a, in a bind, in a, a mood that offers no value. So right now, I don't know when I will go back to my home. Uh, my son who lives in uh, Uganda doesn't know when he'll go back to his home. So those homes are, you know, they're very important to us. But am I, are we going to spend our time brooding because we're not there? So that's where we get caught. And uh, so do not brood about the past. And he asked the question, why? Why do you brood about the past? Because it will take you nowhere. It won't change consciousness. It doesn't change your life. It doesn't give insight. You just brood. And the third line, is why do you fret about the future? And that's key right now. Why do we fret? I'm not speaking about <clears throat> why don't we seek to clearly look at the future or to seek to understand our intuition and guidance toward the future. This is a different word. Why do we fret about the future? Especially in this time of uncertainty, there's a naturalness to go there. But the other thing about fret, fretting is it doesn't take you anywhere. It's another unproductive mood that possesses you. So I'm fretting about the future, I'm fretting and fretting, but I don't know what the future is going to be. I don't know when I will return home. Manuel doesn't know when he'll go back to Uganda. My fretting doesn't change any of that. But it puts me in a very lost place if I'm there. So why do I fret about the future? And there's a feminine gift that we need to learn in this time and we've denied it in our culture. A feminine practice is waiting because you have to wait when you're pregnant. You have to wait when you're dying. It's an unfoldment in soul time. 
Well, we're going to have to wait. We're going to have to practice that feminine, deep feminine practice that allows gestation. And we're not used to that. We want it all now, and we want it right away, and we want it fast, and we want it quick. The feminine, it's one of the ways it's appearing right now. We have to wait. We don't control the situation. We have to wait for this to unfold. And notice all the anxiousness around the waiting. Because we've lost that gift. It's a feminine gift that's profound. It comes from the soul. So <clears throat> why do I fret about the future? It takes me nowhere. It's a form of suffering that I impose upon myself to fret about the future. Now, what's the last line? Because <clears throat> where is that leading us? And what Dilgo Kense Rinpoche, is, Rinpoche offers, excuse me, I have allergies this time of year. <clears throat> is he says, live in the simplicity, and that is a key word in his teaching, live in the simplicity of the present moment. <clears throat> So right now, in this present moment, yes, there's a huge amount of unknown, a great amount of uncertainty, a lot of fear, a lot of people suffering, and simultaneously where I am, spring is bursting forth in unbelievable beauty, glory, exaltation. The Divine Mother is giving birth all over this planet. So that's also a place that's in this present moment. So I need to remember, all, if I just walk outside, <laughs> I look at the trees around me that weren't green two days ago, and I open to that reality, I'm living in the simplicity of the present moment. Mm -hmm. That's what's there in the present moment, and it's there renewing me enormously renewing me. Hope, as you are dedicated your life to at this stage, when I see the change that can occur in one day, on one street, or in one park, nature's going on with hope. She's giving birth everywhere. <laughs> so she's counterbalancing for us. The synchronicity is incredible. What we're feeling in our time facing the possibility of illness and death She's reminding us of birth, of unfoldment, of the affirmation of life. <clears throat> and with nature, I don't have to get complicated. I'm in the presence. She holds me. It's a refuge. So I think one of the things people need to do is to find a connection to nature, even in the quarantine aspect, mm -hmm. especially this time of year. And it brings us into simplicity rather than all the complicated <clears throat> thoughts that are going through us, many of which are not that relevant. So I'll repeat it again. And this is the way I would suggest you do it as a practice, okay? You may break it down and start with the first line <clears throat> and spend two weeks just on the first line both the saying of it, but then the practicing it in your life. So a mentor of mine, Reb Zalman Shakter, said, I am only the ahas that I integrated into my life. The others came and went. So if I say this for 10 minutes in the morning, it has a value, but am I carrying it through my life through the day? So you may begin to work with the first line and repeat it a number of of time, so you hear it deeply inside. Do not burden your mind with useless thoughts. Do not burden your mind with useless thoughts. Do not burden your mind with useless thoughts.
why do you brood about the past? Why do you brood about the past? <clears throat> Why? Why do you brood about the past? Why do you fret about the future? Why do you fret about the future? Why? Why do you fret about the future? Live in the simplicity of the present moment. Live in the simplicity of the present moment. Live in the simplicity of the present moment. Now sigh a gentle long sigh three times. And recognize if you're truly in the present moment, not in the burdensome thoughts or the brooding emotions, but you're in the present moment, it's vast, it's spacious. And everything you need for that present moment is there. That is why sometimes the present moment is called the Holy Grail. The divine presence is in each moment, but often we're not present to it. So you, you drink from the present moment. Live in the simplicity of the present moment. So if I were to put it another way, when I turned 60, Reb Zalman said to me, <clears throat> Reb is a, a title for someone in Jewish mysticism. He was also a rabbi. He said, what it really means to be an elder, spiritually speaking, is you live from the state of being, not from the state of doing. So that even when you're doing, you're living from the state of being. And to me, that has a great parallel to living in the present moment. I can be engaged in many things, but I'm living from the present moment. 
And uh, I find that deeply helpful. So I hope it's of help to you. Thank you. That's that is beautiful. Um, we will send out these um, uh, meditations um, by email afterwards. So uh, not to worry uh, if you didn't get a chance to write them down, if you don't remember. Um, so thank you, Atum. That was lovely um, and so rich as always. Uh, I feel like I could, oh, after Seth sitting with you, I always feel that I could, you know, spend the next month or two just digesting um, what you've offered. Uh, so by way of digestion, um, we're going to um, now, as we said, put you into small groups um, through the miracle of Zoom breakout rooms. Uh, we'll put you in groups of three and you'll have five minutes each. Uh, and the invitation is to, uh, if you're speak for each person to take five minutes to speak, uh, the question I'm going to suggest is what is unfolding for me at this time? So we've talked about grace. We've talked about looking and noticing. Uh, we've talked about being in this present moment. Um, so the question I invite you to speak to is what is unfolding for me at this time? So the uh, speaker, just whatever comes to you to speak, try and stay, you know, um, take a moment to connect and be, be uh, centered in the body. Uh, not from a story about what you've thought, perhaps, but maybe what is arising in you this morning. Uh, from being uh, together at this time and to the listeners to just give your uh, compassionate witness self your best attention um, this isn't a chance to offer advice or to resonate with uh, me too um, <clears throat> well you might do that energetically but I'd suggest you do it silently um, and just uh, just see what comes um, and we're going to reconvene in 15 minutes to close so it's not a lot of time uh, we'll send you a prompt in the room to let you know when it's time to switch. Um, uh, so um, Ling and KK are going to magically put you into a breakout room. Uh, so strap yourselves in and we'll see you in 15 minutes. Well, thank you. I mean, it really is a landscape for my soul, Holly Hop. The, the garden, the beach, the woods. I mean, it's got it all and the people mm -hmm. and the people for sure so thank you well we can't wait to welcome you all back here uh when it is safe to do so we're in uh daily conversation uh, the board and the management team at hollyhawk about how to um how to open the campus back up at the right time and how to continue reaching out to you all um <clears throat> and making offerings of this kind so there are uh this is week five in a six-part series. Um, there is a sixth offering next week at the same time uh, with Reverend Angel Kyoto Williams, uh, who is a Buddhist teacher and liberation activist, um, amazing woman. Um, and then we'll be in touch with more details from there. But um, just but before we close, um, uh, there's, a, there's, oh, there's over a hundred of us here. Um, how was that for people? Give us a little, give us a little twinkle. <laughs> Great. Um, thank you so much for participating. Um, Atum, would you like to offer us any, um, any words of closing? And, uh, and I have a special request, which is that maybe you could lead us in, uh, among us, anything else you'd like to offer, that you could lead us in the meditation that I opened with. Well, one, there's another teaching I would pass on from His Holiness Dilgo Kense Rinpoche. And uh, it has two parts. And the first part is when you're dying, who are you going to call out to? And then he said, get very clear on the answer and don't wait to die. Practice it whenever you are in deep need. Know where you can turn for refuge. And I really, it's one of the most important teachings I feel for right now and for what we may face as a planet in the future. Where are you going to find refuge? So who are you going to call out to? 
if you're in different traditions, you may call out to different to God or the goddess or Christ or Kuan Yin, but find out who are you going to call out to. And maybe it's not an archetypal figure like that. Maybe it's your community that you're going to call out to. But know where to turn in a passage, in a crisis, in a lost place. And the second practice that Dilgo Kense Rinpoche gave, which is profound for me, is what's the state that you want to be in when you're dying? Now, why that's profound? He said, first of all, really contemplate that and practice it. Don't wait to die and then think, oh, what's the state I want to be in for this passage? Or wait as you're dying, well, who am I going to call out to? Have those as resources in your life and practice those states and build that relationship. And I think that's one of the things that as we're in this time is a core practice and something that we can develop that's a very important piece. And the other piece is to recognize some people actually will call out to you for refuge. Some people will look to you for refuge and recognize that. Recognize the difference between when somebody's just uh, searching for something and when someone actually is calling out to you to be there as a source of ref refuge. So it goes both ways. Mm -hmm. And the recognition of that, I think refuge is extremely important. For some people, it may be nature, but find the place of refuge that can hold you. And that's what refuge does. It holds you. Mm -hmm. So the Dalai Lama speaks of why do we turn to the three jewels, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha? Because they're larger, superior beings, he uses the word. But the larger beings that can hold us through that passage. And uh, just search for yours. That's the key piece. The, what, the place where you can turn and, and find refuge to be held. Uh, to come that will hold you so you can come back into your own center. So this is a practice that Karen beautifully led. And I, go, I have gone to Bhutan 12 times. And there's a figure in Bhutan who is called Patma Sambhava. He's called the second Buddha. He's the major figure in Bhutanese Buddhism. <clears throat> and uh, you will find statues and paintings of him everywhere. So <clears throat> there is a statue that I came across in a temple. And uh, it's never left me that that statue, this is what an icon means. An icon is a doorway that you can go through the doorway into the state. And the state comes through the art, the iconic art into you. It is a doorway. And I looked at the statue of Guru Rinpoche, who is Patma Sambhava, and I just asked, tell me how to get in that state because it was so awesome to me to see the state conveyed through the statue. And then this is the practice that was given back to me. So if you'll just, I will say it, and then you repeat it. Um, and that's how we'll do the practice, okay? So take a couple of easy sighs. Padma Chodron speaks about being able to change your attunement or state of being in three sighs, three breaths. So I'll say the phrase, then you say the phrase and sigh, deeply rooted. Deeply rooted. Deeply rooted. Deeply rooted 
in the present moment. Deeply rooted in the present moment. Deeply rooted in the present moment. Seeing with a clear, open, spacious mind. Seeing with a clear, open, spacious mind. Seeing with a clear, open, spacious mind. Seeing with a clear, open, spacious mind beyond doubt and fear. Seeing with a clear, open, spacious mind beyond doubt and fear. Abiding in the luminous heart of equanimity. Abiding in the luminous heart of equanimity. Abiding in the luminous heart of equanimity. Abiding in the luminous heart of equanimity, the way unfolds before me. The way unfolds before me. The way unfolds before me. Holding the center open to grace, connected to refuge. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. May the way unfold before everyone. If you would like to unmute and just say goodbye, we're going to close now. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Bye.